afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Forrest Versell. I serve as lead evangelist here in the central region of the Phoenix Church of Christ, and uh, so glad to be together today. I, I nearly didn't make it today, as a matter of fact. Uh, my, myself and my three teenage daughters were at the uh, church family teen camping weekend up in Flagstaff. It uh, started with a road trip with me and my three daughters listening to Camp Rock, the musical, and Beyonce, and lots of other songs I'm not very familiar with. That was awesome. I always enjoy that. And, uh, but we got there, had an incredible time, incredible time of fellowship uh, with lots of, uh, we had about 100 parents and teens there. Just an incredible time talking about how God really wants to build family and how teens and parents are meant to be together, not apart. And uh, it was a great time, very encouraged, very thankful for our youth and family ministry uh, here in the church. Uh, but I wasn't supposed to preach today. Willie uh, Price was scheduled to preach today. And I got a call Saturday morning at 8 a.m. from Willie, and I thought, oh, no. Oh, no, because most of us know Capri, his wife, is, is due uh, next week. And uh, the good news is uh, Boston Taylor Price was born yesterday, six pounds, 14 ounces, 20 and a half inches, and mom and baby are doing well. So you'll have to wait to hear, hear from that sermon later on from Willie, uh, and, I, and you're stuck with me today. Uh, we're going to continue our series here of, of By Faith from Hebrews chapter 11, so you can be uh, turning there. Last Sunday, uh, we looked at Hebrews chapter 11, really just, just verse 1, right? We looked at this, uh, this first verse here and how it really defines faith. And these two uh, really rich Greek words are translated here as, as faith being, being you know, confidence and assurance uh, in our belief and understanding of God in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 1. Uh, and, and, and those two Greek words are very rich in meaning as we talked about, and they really have to do with thinking and reality, they can be translated for confidence, assurance, conviction, but also proof, evidence, and substance. And so really in a lot of ways to live by faith is to, is to have your thinking, you know, meet reality, right? And we talked a lot about that and the way we, we reason through life. But reasoning is not just an intellectual exercise, according to the Bible. It's also something you have to act out. And I came up with a new word last week. You may or may not remember the new word. There's mansplaining, voluntelling, things like that. But we came up with a new word called faithshin. I don't know if, you, if that stuck for any of you or if you, if you, if you took to that. Uh, but I gave you a faithshin challenge. And I put out mine there. And, I, and I'll share about mine in a moment. But I'm wondering with the faithshin challenge where belief and reality meet, if anyone was able to, to have a challenge with their faith, uh, meeting, meeting an action, and they are able to share it at this time. We have the mic here, the cube mic. So, Eric, if you can come out and uh, see who... who, who. Anybody, any, any volunteers from any faith over the last week? I'll just tell my story if no one does. There was there any... Oh, we may, we may not do this. <laughs> I think we're good. Right. Yep. Okay. <laughs> any volunteers, something that happened over the last week with, with your faith and action combining together that you'd like... Anybody want to share? Is there a hand over here? Perry. No, no yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Now you can throw it. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I had a goal to... I didn't hear about this till Wednesday. We were in Flagstaff last week. But uh, I had a goal to every day uh, get out early and kind of have a Jericho walk around my uh, complex, praying for the people that I know and just otherwise, and also praying for people at work. I've only had semi-success with this. Uh, it hasn't been daily, but uh, I've had some good results, and I'm encouraged to keep going with it. Faith in action, a prayer walk. I like that. That's great. Jericho walk. Anybody else? Oh, hey, just pass it on to Ralph there. Oh, you can just hand it, yeah. Hey, um, I guess my faith in action was me volunteering to lead the little men's group yesterday. Because right. you were away at camp. Right. And the Sons I was of Thunder meeting. I was inspired by my quiet times on a particular topic on guarding your heart. And when you asked if anybody would volunteer, I waited a little bit because, you know, I figured there'd be somebody that would step up. And, but then, you know what? I decided nobody stepped up. So <laughs> let me share my faith about the topic that I've been inspired about. And, nice. And, and so that was in and I heard it was an awesome meeting, bro. Oh, you stepped you. up. That was great. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? Over here. Way over here. Pavel there. Yeah, all the way in the back. One more here. 
What's up, Eric? So uh, the Bible talks about serving orphans and widows as good religion. And a number of folks yesterday put that in action and risk crossing the border, you know, being pesky with officers at the border, <laughs> crossed over and served orphans and widows. Uh, folks came from many different places. It was very special. Uh, our sister Monica here did face painting with a lot of these folks, and she's coming all the way up from Washington. Amen. So those of you that served yesterday, thank you so much for practicing good religion. Yes. That is very, very special. The book of James in action. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. There you go. Thanks, everybody, for sharing. Uh, you know, we're, we're just getting this, this faith and ball rolling here, you know, as we go through, uh, you know, our study here of Hebrews 11. For me, I put out there to you guys, I was going to try to share with people, instead of just inviting them to church or, or letting them know about our church, I was going to just try to see if they'd hear a scripture from me. And so I was able to share with about 10, 12 people, John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32, um, and I won't get into the scripture itself. You can look at that later if you're not familiar with it. But uh, as we were at ASU Monday night, we didn't have any visitors coming to our little Bible discussion. Me and some of the students just went out. We just started talking to people. And I pulled out John 8, 31 to 32 with a young lady who was walking by. And she was listening to praise and worship music. She was so excited to, to, to read that scripture. And she was so excited to hear what we were doing uh, based on that scripture that she came to midweek the next uh, night at ASU. And she brought a friend as well. And they're now getting connected to our campus ministry there at ASU. Uh, and so, you know, just, just, a little, just a little step of faith sometimes, you know. Uh, you know, taking what we believe and putting it into action can open up all kinds of doors for all of us. And I hope we will continue uh, as a church not just to learn here on Sundays, but to do something about it Monday through Saturday. Amen? And so we're reading on here. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2 uh, goes on to, to speak of, of, you know, this in verse 2 referring to faith. This is what the ancients were commended for. Uh, you know, faith is commendable. And I want to commend you today. If you have faith in Jesus, that is commendable. You should be proud of that in a good way. You should be excited about that. Uh, if that was true in the first century, that it was commendable to have faith, then how much more so today when we live in an age of, of unbelief, right, in a lot of ways and a, and a lack of faith as things get more and more secularized. Uh, and so I want to encourage you, if you have faith today, that that, that is awesome. Uh, hang on to that and build that and develop that and grow that. And hopefully that's why you're here uh, to do just that. But we'll read on here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Uh, the text goes on to say, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. The Hebrew writer here uh, is, is, is ultimately quoting Genesis chapter 1. Uh, you know, and specifically in the beginning, it says in Genesis 1, verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And so, uh, you know, the Hebrew writer is referring to this, this cascade effect. God spoke and boom, right? The, the universe started to exist. This is actually a picture taken by the Hubble telescope those aren't stars, those are galaxies. Uh, there's, there's thousands of galaxies just in this photo. The Hubble telescope has, has helped us to see how, how massive the universe is. And the Hebrew writer here says, at God's command, the universe came to be. Uh, in Hebrews 11, verse 3. Uh, you know, the Hubble telescope, uh, based on what they've been able to observe of, of, the, of the universe through it, uh, they think there's about 100 billion galaxies, but they estimate there may be 100 billion more. Uh, as they get more and more photos deeper and deeper uh, into uh, the universe. And, and it's just unfathomable to understand how big the universe is when you look into space. And so if you, take, if you took a grain of sand today and you walked outside, and you took that grain of sand and you held it up in front of your eye, that little portion that the grain of sand covers in the sky, that would cover about 10,000 galaxies. So then the rest of the sky has other galaxies in it. In proportion to that, that one little speck of sand in front of your eye that holds 10,000 galaxies you know, out there in the universe. And so the, the universe is just massive. It's beyond our understanding uh, in many ways. And even as I try to do that, some of you right now are like, I don't, I don't understand that. You know, it, it's, it's hard to understand. And we, of course, live in the Milky Way galaxy, and it's a spiral galaxy, and this is a, a picture of it. And that little dot there, that's the area that our solar system exists in. We just exist on one of the arms of the bands of the spirals of this massive Milky Way galaxy. You know, we're just a little speck, you know, right? Uh, you know, within that speck 
uh, in, that, in that massive Milky Way galaxy. There are about 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone, the Milky Way galaxy. If you were to count every one of those stars and never take a break, count one star every second. And the Bible tells us to count the stars, right, which is kind of, you know, um, you know ironic. Uh, it would take you 30 years, never stopping, to count to 200 billion. That's how long it would take you just to count all the stars in just the Milky Way galaxy. You know, we're, 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 and, and we're, of course, uh, within that galaxy, you know, a speck on that speck, you know, uh, is, is, is the planet Earth. Because the planet Earth, you know, uh, along with eight other planets, seven other planets now, there's no longer nine. Pluto, Pluto got dethroned, poor Pluto, you know, from being a planet. I don't know, how, how, did they vote on that? Or how does that work anyway? But uh, so, so the Earth is, is one of the smaller planets, right, in our solar system. We're 93 million miles away from the closest star, which we call the sun, right? Uh, but, but the actual solar system is it's 7 billion miles in diameter. 7 billion miles from the sun to the Neptune-Pluto area uh, is, just, is just our solar system. They're talking about you know, sending people to Mars. It's going to take them you know, years and years just to send somebody to Mars, which is just the next planet. And those people are like saying goodbye to their family if they even can go. We don't, we're not even there yet technology-wise, because it's just so far away that we'll never see them again. You know, the Bible says, you know, God, God spoke, and all of this came into existence. And then, of course, you know, we're on our little planet here, you know, planet Earth. And, and even if you just look at God speaking the Earth into existence, it's pretty blow away. I lived in uh, Australia for about four years, and uh, north, uh, northeast of, of Australia is the Marianas Trench, the Marianas Trench. And that trench is so deep you could take Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world, flip it upside down and bury it in the trench. That's how deep that trench is. If you, if you drop your keys in there, forget it, man, because they're gone. They're gone. It's deep. And it was just so blow away to me. I was, I was flying from Australia to Papua New Guinea. I worked with some of the churches in Papua New Guinea a bit. And uh, just to think that, you know, if the plane went down right there, man, like it's, it's over. It's over. It's just, it was awe-inspiring to think about that. And uh, you know, I, I, I got to go to, to Africa in 1997 for Hope Youth Corps, and I was sitting there at, you know, at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, the tallest freestanding mountain in the world, and you're looking at lions and elephants and zebras, and it's just like, this is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. You go up to the Grand Canyon just three hours north of here, and you just see this, you know, these incredible geological structures. You go down to the Amazon rainforest, you know, and they're, they're still finding plant species and animal species that they've never discovered before. Every year, there's more and more species that we've never even known existed. You know, all, all of this occurred, you know, you know, the blue whale to the gnat, you know, it all occurred. All this came by God's command, the Hebrew writer says there in verse 3. And we, and we marvel, we marvel at the universe, and we should. It's, it's pretty blow away to kind of go through, you know, to zoom out and to zoom in. But how much more so should we marvel at God's word, which created it all and sustains it, you know, to this very moment? But as the writer says there, it takes faith. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And it's interesting when you, when you go through, you know, God, when he sent the first humans, the Genesis account says he sent the first humans in there, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, and he gave them a command, right? He said, you, you may eat from all these trees, but do not eat. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Just, just one command to follow, right? And, they, and like us, they messed it up, right? They couldn't, they couldn't obey the one command. And so the, the pinnacle of God's creation, man and woman, whom he also spoke into existence, they did not listen to God's word. And from that, the, the fall occurred. And uh, God, you know, uh, then provides more and more uh, of his word to try to, to try to help them and try to guide them. And that's really what we have in the, in the Pentateuch, right? The Old Testament, the first, you know, five books of the Bible. And eventually they... These people that God raises up through his word, they, they eventually are to become a nation, Israel, right? From the, from the 12 tribes, the, sons of, the descendants of Jacob, they become slaves in Egypt, and they eventually get freed by Moses, who, who helps them to, you know, to, to go. Uh, and, and as Moses is leading them toward the promised land, they're, they're about to become a nation for the first time officially as they enter into the promised land. This is all prophesied about right long ago. Uh, what, does Moses, what, does he, what does he say to God's people there as they're about to enter in? He says in Deuteronomy 11... You know, verses 27 to 28, he says, if you listen to God's words, you'll be blessed. But as you enter into the land, if you don't listen to his words, you will be cursed. And we know uh, the rest of the story, if you know much about the history of Israel, there were many ups and downs. 
as they did or did not follow God's commands, God's words in the rise of the kings and the prophets. And then, the, and then of course, Jesus arrives on the scene, you know, a descendant of, of those people, an Israelite himself. And in John chapter 1, uh, verse 1, something shifts. It says there in John's gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And so what, what, what is this, this word? It's, it's a bit mysterious. It's a, it's a Greek word, logos, and it, the Greeks, they believed it to be like the, the power behind all power, kind of their, their, their version of, 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 of saying God in a sense. Um, and then in verse 14, John identifies the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And so, you know, Jesus, you know, became the word incarnate. He, he became the walking word, right? And, and that's what baffled the Jews in Jesus' day with Jesus himself. He would, he would claim to be speaking the very words of God. And the Jews, they either believed in him and they followed him or they wanted him killed. And eventually the ones that, that were threatened by his words, they got him killed, right? Uh, through, you know, th- th- through the Roman governor there. And of course, Jesus, he dies on a cross uh, but, you know, he, he told his disciples he would die and rise again. Uh, and then when you go on into Luke chapter 24, Jesus now has resurrected from the dead, as the, the Luke's uh, gospel records. And what does Jesus say after he resurrects to his disciples on the road to Emmaus? In Luke 24, verse 25, he says, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He brings them back to the word. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets... He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And uh, what's amazing, uh, you know, Guillermo talked about, you know, Christian apologetics in his communion. Thanks for your communion, bro. Uh, what's amazing about Jesus is he, he fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies in his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. Pretty amazing, pretty blow away. And he talks about it here after he's resurrected to a few of his disciples. And he ascends back to heaven uh, the Bible records in Acts chapter 1. And his final words before he ascends, his final command to his disciples was to wait. Right? Wait in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. Uh, and they do just that. And in Acts 2, uh, the tongues of fire come down on the apostles. They start to speak in tongues. And then Peter stands up in Acts 2, verse 14. And he starts to preach now uh, the first sermon of the new covenant. And, and what is he talking about? He says... To, to, to his Jews who think that some of them are drunk because they're speaking in tongues. He says, oh, no, no, this, this was written about by the prophet Joel. And if you go through that sermon, we don't have time today, in Acts 2, Peter over and over, he's quoting God's word, right? He's going back to God's commands and how these things are being fulfilled in their presence. And 3,000 of the Jews that day in Jerusalem at Pentecost, they get what Peter is saying about God's word, and they're baptized in the name of Jesus, right? And the early church starts to take off. Uh, and what do they devote themselves to in Acts 2, verse 42? The other scripture I've quoted here, the first thing they devote themselves to is the apostles' teaching. Where do you get the apostles' teaching today? Yeah, it's the Bible, and specifically it's the 27 books of the New Testament. John being one we just read, now we're, you know, we read Luke, now we're reading Acts, right? You know, the, the, the New Testament is the apostles' teaching. So that early church, what were they devoted to? They were devoted to the word of God, starting to see a theme here, aren't you? And then, you know, you go on in the book of Acts. uh, In Acts 6, uh, they they appoint uh, their first deacons, um, and uh, Stephen is one of those guys, and it says after that, the word of God spread. And so this this spreading then of the word of God starts to permeate uh, the early church, and many people are becoming Christians. Uh, Again, uh, Stephen is, is one of those guys appointed before the word of God spreads there in Acts 6 to serve the Grecian widows. And then he goes on to preach, and he, he goes on to preach so strongly God's word that the, the Jews in Jerusalem, they decide to stone him to death. And it says in Acts 8, verse 1, Saul approved of their killing him. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So this is the first time the church goes beyond the walls of Jerusalem under the new covenant. And what does Luke note in verse 4? Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And then we know this, this Saul, who approved of, of Stephen's death, will become, uh, through his encounter with Jesus and Jesus' words on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, he'll become the Apostle Paul. And he'll have this incredible transformation uh, you know, through this encounter with Jesus uh, and his words, as we all need to, to become Christians. And so Saul becomes Paul, and Barnabas, who's a, who's a, a Jewish Christian, finds uh, Paul and raises him up. 
and brings them into the church in Antioch. And then the church in Antioch, it says in Acts 13, has teachers and prophets, uh, which are all connected to the, the word of God again. And they decide to send out these first missionaries. So this is the first now deliberate missionary work of the early church. Uh, and, and so Paul and Barnabas start going out and spreading uh, the good news. And in Acts 13... Uh, verse 49, what does it say? The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. So again, the word of the Lord is just continuing to spread. And it spreads to Europe eventually and all of the Roman Empire uh, in Paul's day. And again, Luke notes in Acts 19, verse 20, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. And we're studying out, you know, as a, as a church, we're studying out how to live by faith. Uh, and, and as I said last week, it's really easy a lot of times to to try to, you know, have faith in our faith or try to feel more faith or, you know, or try to intellectualize faith. Uh, but what we see here, really, uh, this pattern uh, in the Old and New Testament is that, is that really our faith should come from what God has already said. Our faith should come from God and what he has commanded in his word. And so if you have no faith, well, you, you lack the word. But if you want to know faith, K-N-O-W, well, you need to know K-N-O-W, the word. And so in many ways, it's simple, but that's always our challenge, isn't it? To really understand these words that we're reading as being the very words of God. And if we really understand the very words of God, they will bring more and more faith into our life. And Paul will summarize Romans 10, 17. Uh, He'll summarize it in this way. He says, consequently, faith comes not from a great church service on Sunday or when God works out everything perfectly in your life or... Your, your great-grandmother who read the Bible to you every day. or No, no. Faith from, comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. In Romans 10, verse 17. You know, the, uh, there was a Reformation. You probably know that if you know anything about church history uh, in, the, in the 16th century. And, and really what happened was uh, the word of God was only really available at this point uh, in Latin. It was only translated in Latin at this point from Greek. And the only people at that point in the 1600s who really knew Latin well were, were the Catholic priests. And one of those Catholic priests was Martin Luther. And the more he started reading his Bible, hearing God's word, the more he realized they were, they were off in a lot of ways from what God expected of them. And one of the most hideous things that he you know, really challenged within the Roman Catholic Church at that time was the practice of indulgences. You could, you could pay a certain amount for a certain sin to be forgiven by God. Uh, and so it was, it was really some, some crazy stuff going on there. It had drifted so far from God's word. And so Martin Luther and many of the reformers in that time, they were trying to call the, the church back to the word of God. And what's interesting is in that time, uh, they started calling the church, uh, they started calling the church the creature of the word. They started calling the church the creature of the word. And I kind of I like that idea, you know, you know for, for, for an explanation of what, what the church is. Because they believed the church did not form the gospel the gospel formed the church. And so it, it's God's word that has brought us here today. It's not a building. It's not a group of people. It's not an association. It's God's word, right, that has brought us together here today as the church. And Martin Luther said this, for since the church owes its birth to the word, is nourished, aided, and strengthened by it, it is obvious that it cannot be without the word. If it is without the word, it ceases to be a church. And so it really begs of us uh, then to ask ourselves as a church, you know, by faith, what do we really believe about God's word? Even as we're going through these scriptures, does it really matter to you? I mean, is this really important to you that we're looking at these scriptures right now? I mean, why are we even doing this? I mean, think about it for a second. And I'm not trying to run you out of here. I'm glad you're here. But there's other things you could be doing right now with your time. But if these words really are the very words of God himself, who created the universe at his command, then these words, they have great value. They have great power. They can change me. They can change you. They can change our city. And they have changed the world. But how much does the word of God burn in us, move us, and shape us? I think we have to ask ourselves that question. You know, we we think we know it sometimes. Yeah, you know, I've, been, I've been a Christian now almost 25 years, but it's amazing to me how much I don't know. The more I dig into the Bible, I realize how much I don't know about the Bible. There's so much more to learn. You know, we, we, we can think, well, we're, we're, we're following it, man. We're following it. Well, yeah, yes and no. 
We, we, are, we are always trying to follow it if we're Christians, but we're always falling short, right, of that which it's calling us to. And we, and we can even think, you know, we get enough of it. You know, okay, for us, wrap it up here. You've been going for a little while now. You know, we, we can even feel that way sometimes. Well, yeah, again, yes and no. I mean, when, when are we getting too much of the Bible in our lives? I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure there's a point where we're going to reach that, you know? But we can feel that way, can't we? I've had enough. I've had enough. I was at family camp. This is like my fifth lesson. I guess I'm speaking this one, but, you know, you understand what I'm saying. And I give you an example from my own life. Uh, last, yeah, last week, my wife's family came in town, and we were having a great time, and, and I noticed a moving truck across the street from the house we rent. And I thought, oh, that's strange, because I know this family. I've been reaching out to them, and so I walk over, and, and, uh, and it's, it's a mixed family. They're not married, and, and the guy is moving out. I was just like, oh, man, you know, I'm sorry, man. Do you need some help moving? He says, well, I got my buddy here right now, but we're going to come back in probably about two hours. I could use maybe a little bit of help. And so we were actually going off to, the, to, to swim with the, all the little kids in, in, in our family. And so I was like, okay, well, I should be back about then. And so I pulled back up after a few hours, and there's the moving truck. You know, I was like, oh, perfect. I can, I can help this guy out, and I want to reach out to this guy anyway. And so we pull in, you know, getting all the swim stuff out, you know, all the little nieces and nephews and my kids. And, and we get in the house, and I grab a drink, and... And I completely forgot that my neighbor across the street was moving at that point. I just, I just blanked. I was just on the back porch, you know, sipping some iced tea the rest of the night, you know. And, uh, and I just thought, oh, man, you know, I lo- love your neighbor for us, you know. And, and I, just, I just forgot, just like that. And the truck was right there as I pulled into the driveway. That's how quickly I forgot. And maybe I'm more forgetful than the average person. But uh, I really wanted, wanted to help him. And I think my, my walk with God's word is a lot like that. How quickly, how quickly I can forget the power of his word. How quickly I can forget the blessing that it's brought into my life. How quickly I can forget the light it can bring into a dark situation in my life. And so today, I just really want to encourage us to be humble toward God's word. If we want to grow in our faith, we've got to grow in our hunger for God's word. It's where faith is born. It's where faith grows, and it's where faith stays. So if you're lacking faith today, well, in some way you're lacking the word of God in your life. And it may not be hearing it, it may be getting it. You know, it may not be just getting it, it might be living it. You know, it it could be all three of those things. You know, I don't know where you're at, but if your faith is lacking, start with God's word and look there. You know, just just think about it for a moment. If you you became a Christian, you know, you, you opened up God's word. That's all you did. And it, and it transformed your thinking. It transformed the way you live your life. It transformed the, the, the decisions that you're making to this very day. That's how powerful it is, right, when you open up God's word. You know, I think about, you know, not just getting saved, but then once I got saved through God's word, the way God's word guided me even as a young Christian. You know, as a young Christian, just, you know, you, you, you're pulled out of the world, but the world, you know, you're, it's still kind of all over you. It's kind of, you know, you've got you to shower off spiritually for a while, you know, once you get out of that mess. And I was 19, I was quite young. And I uh, just never forget reading Psalm 73. It's my favorite psalm. If you're struggling with, the, with the temptations in the world, read Psalm 73 for a while. It will change your perspective. And I would just cling to that psalm. And it helped me just to, to get away from the worldliness and all the stuff that was calling me back to the pig pen. Uh, I remember that as a young Christian. I remember as a young Christian, you know, I, I decided, based on what I saw in the Bible, to only date disciples. And I remember counting the cost on that. Because when I came into a campus ministry back in 1995 in Cincinnati... I didn't think any of the sisters were even that attractive. But that was my dating life based on what I decided, based on God's word. I was going to only date disciples. But I remember reading Jeremiah 17. You know, I have have plans for you. I have hope for you to, you know, to take care of you in the future. And then Mandy came around six years later, amen, and I've been married, you know, 19 years now. Uh, You know, I remember getting a call from some of the brothers. They're like, we we believe you could could go into the full-time ministry. And I laughed at them when they said that because I thought... I'm not somebody who should be leading anything in God's church at all. I'm just lucky to be here. And I remember reading Mark 1 for a quiet time around that time, and Jesus said, come follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. I thought, okay, well, if I just follow him, hopefully I can figure it out. And I'm still working on that. Amen. You know, and even recently, you know, my my faith shouldn't challenge to go out and use John 8. It was honestly because I felt like I'm inviting a lot of people to church, and I'm telling them about why I moved here and about the great Phoenix church that I'm a part of, but no one's coming. No, you know, no one's showing up. So I thought, well, let me, let me just bring God's word into it a bit more and get rid of my words, because my words are meaningless. And the next thing I know, I find this young lady, and she brings out a friend last Wednesday. You know? so, so, so I just want to share all that with you guys, because you know, we, we cannot be the church without the word. And we've got to feed the creature more and more with the word. 
And that starts with us individually, and that also comes out collectively as a group. You know, if, if you're new to us today, I'm glad you're here, and I want to ask you, ha- have you encountered the biblical Christ? What's very popular in Christianity today is, is to be emotional. And I think you should feel some emotion when you really encounter the, 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 biblical, the biblical Christ, but, but it's, not, it's, not, it's not emotion that you need to get to. It's, it's, it's faith in him. And, and, and emotion is not going to be enough in the end. You know, you can, you can raise your hands and you can sing a song to him, but, but you've got to get in the word to really find faith in him. To find saving faith in him, you've got to get in the word. We, re, we saw that in Romans 10, verse 17. So if you're, if you're new to us today, I, I want to encourage you to, to study the Bible with us as a church and, and see what we really believe from God's word it means to be a Christian. And I believe that will be a very powerful thing for you uh, to find God's power in your life through his word. Uh, and, and, and church, uh, you know, t- this week, our, our faith uh, for this week is to take an area you lack in faith and bring God's word into it and apply it every day. Just, just think about where you're lacking faith and, and think about a scripture you could just bring into that every day this week and see what God might do as you take his mighty word, his mighty word, which we just read about, created the, the whole universe at his command. Take that mighty word into if you're lacking love or you're lacking forgiveness or you're, you're lacking outreach or you're lacking service and see how God's word can, can, can give you faith and bring you faith. Friends, uh, church, you know, let's understand Hebrews 11 verse 3. By faith there is incredible power in God's word. It formed the universe and it can still form and shape us. Form and shape us into the men and women God has called us to be. And so let's open our hearts more and more to his word, and let's go out this week and live it out in our faith and our commitment to him and one another. And the uh, central region uh, said amen. Thank you.